the railroad pictures, Westward the Course of Empire, actually began as a, a chapter of another project. Okay, so the, the way I work is I don't really have a clear sense of what I'm doing when I begin. I'm out there, I'm looking at things, thinking about what I see, and trying to figure out how to deal with it as material for my art. That project was going to have these different layers of history that were visible from the prehistoric times to the near present. This provided me a way of thinking about how the past is present in the landscape. So I went to photograph the Union Pacific coming from Nebraska. When I developed the film, made the prints later that year, I was completely fascinated with the ones I'd made of the rock cuts. This was something that read at first glance as a natural phenomenon, but in fact it was engineered. It spoke a lot about the relationship of technology and the land. If the railroad can't go over the mountain, you cut a hole in the mountain. Every picture, whether it's a grade, a cut, or a tunnel, it's more or less the same picture. I stand in the same place with the same lens, so the rendering of space is identical in all the pictures. The camera's always at the same height. And there was nothing scientific about it, it just was a convenient way of making the same picture hundreds of times in different places. The three rows of four of the 12 is my preferred structure for this work. It seems to be small enough that one could take it in as a single image from a distance, and also, unlike 15, there's no center to a grid of 12, and that, that's important, I think. Uh, so there's no real privileging of one work over the others. Each one of them has the name of the railroad written in pencil underneath. And that's a way of sort of paying attention to the history because in this group, there's 12 different pictures, there are also 12 different railroad names. That suggests as well the, the breadth and scale and scope of, of this kind of madness almost. I love the poetry of those names. So many of them are something and something, so they speak about this real or potential connection. You know, Tonopah and Tidewater. The Tonopah and Tidewater never got to anything resembling Tidewater, so it was a kind of, you know, it was a, in some sense, it also suggests the failure of the enterprise, uh, at least in terms of its original promise. Some of these railroads, I mean, some of them went from Omaha, Nebraska to Sacramento, but others went from that mountain to that junction, you know, five miles, and it was only used for a few years to pull out whatever wealth was there. They run the gamut in terms of, of their original function, but I saw it as a kind of um, marker of something that was sort of central to um, both to the reality and the, and the mythos of, of the West. In Europe, the railroad connected existing places, but in North America, it created places. I guess I define myself as a landscape photographer, but I've always been interested in the landscape in terms of human history. I was invited uh, to be an artist in residence at Joshua Tree National Park. And I got out there and I had no clue what to do because that park was spick and span. And that's when I maybe I really understood that I'm basically a photographer of trash, you know, of like all the residue and junk that people leave behind. Outside of Joshua Tree National Park, there are thousands of these abandoned houses literally thousands, and I'd been driving past them for a decade thinking, oh, that's really interesting. And uh, the residency at Joshua allowed me to kind of explore that, and I started photographing these houses. I think the house pictures are also a kind of landscape photograph. You know, these houses are in various degrees of decomposition. They're returning to the land, but they're landscape photograph in the way their railroad pictures are. They're pictures that are about our relationship uh, to the land itself. And more particularly, they're related to the mythology of the West, the frontier and that, because these are people that for lots of different reasons are living not outside of society, but on the margins of society. There's an illusion in those like, communities that one is outside the law, one could do what one pleases. They're not even communities, really. I'm not even sure what to call them. 
of these unincorporated zones of human habitation. Now, if you wanted to find the contemporary equivalent of the frontier, you, you turn back east from the Pacific. Um, and, there, and these places I've been photographing are in a kind of big ring around the metropolitan Los Angeles area. I was photographing houses I was in a place called Lucerne Valley. I set up the camera, there was this really beautiful late light on this house, and for whatever reason, I missed it. The, uh, I, something went wrong, I had to move the camera or pick up something, the light died, the building just became dull gray, and sort of in a fit of peevishness, I photographed it anyway. Just, you know. And I, I was really intrigued with the results because in some way it heightened the, the mystery and the sense of isolation of that place. And then I realized there was also a very particular quality of light that the photographic material rendered that I was aware of but couldn't really name. In those desert regions, there's very little moisture in the air. Edges are really, really sharp. Distances are much more confusing. But when the sun goes down below the horizon, at least in my mind, these things just sort of stand up and glow for a few minutes. For me, there was a kind of beauty that was very place-specific. The light emphasized a social condition that those buildings represented to me. And there was just something really formally beautiful about the black and white photograph that resulted from that, you know. So those three things came together in that picture called Dusk. I think there's a note of tragedy in that work, for sure. And I'm interested in that. I, I think I'm interested in, it maybe sounds a bit pompous, but the landscape of failure. But I also think there's a bit of affection and, and humor as well. I return to places again and again. I'm always curious, like, what happened to that? Or maybe, you know, not, not to make a better picture, but maybe there's, what's the next stage in the, in the life of that spot? And I've noticed that sometimes a place that looked completely shattered and woebegone is now occupied. <laughs> and I always find that really interesting. <laughs>